Hi guys, it's Chelsea from Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome back to my channel. I am so happy to be here making a video for you today. I know it has been a long time since I have posted and that is just because it has been pedal to the metal busy over here. We have had so many projects going on and we basically gave ourselves a couple of months to just really buckle down and get some of the big projects that we really needed to get done so that we would have the rest of the summer to just do a lot of the maintenance stuff that needs to happen on a farm. I thought the best way to get back into doing videos for you guys was to be able to do a 2020 garden tour. It is the 22nd of June today and things are really starting to grow in the garden. It's been a bit of a rocky start to the gardening season like it has been for a lot of people. We've had very cool temperatures. We had frost, I think the 10th of June, which is the latest I have ever seen frost here in our area. It's been really cool, which has stunted the growth of a lot of plants and I ended up losing I think it was around 200 bean plants that I had planted that had just started to come up and then a frost came and actually it wasn't even a frost it was just cold enough temperatures and cold enough wind to freeze them all so I ended up having to replant those but that's okay now that it's warming up things are starting to grow I don't know if I'm going to get as good of a squash harvest as I usually get because like I'll show you in a few minutes my squash plants are teeny tiny <laughs> but several exciting things are happening in the garden and I'm looking forward to sharing all of that with you. One of the exciting things that is going on in my garden this year is that we are, are on to year two of the forest garden. This space back here is a really good example of the kind of permaculture food forest or permaculture garden that I am going for. Um, back here in the very back there's a red currant that was actually planted from a little tiny bush about this big last spring I'm so happy with the way that's growing it obviously likes that location and then this is a beautiful pink rose that I actually transplanted from a different area of my garden there is a whole bunch of echinacea that all came back this year which is really exciting to me um, one of the things about perennial herbs most perennial plants is you usually can't start harvesting off them for at least a year or two so I'm going to be able to start harvesting some of the echinacea this year because you definitely want to give that its second year. Um, this is wild bergamot and you can use this to make tea. It also has beautiful flowers. Borage down here. Can you see that? Yes, you can. Um, this is a borage that's self-seeded here and that's just going to look beautiful when it grows up. Um, what else do I have in here? There's California poppies that self-seeded back over here. And not only does it look beautiful, but as these plants get bigger, they're gonna start choking out all of the weeds in the grass because I'll tell you, I have been battling the cooch grass. Honestly, it is the bane of my existence in this forest garden all spring long. Here, I'll give you an example. See these little rhizomes that come off the bottom of the grass? So if you just break off one of these and you just stick that in the ground, you are going to get an entirely new plant. So it's very hard to eradicate. But one of the things that does seem to choke it out is when all of the larger perennials start taking over the space. Um, so that's the long-term goal. I'm hoping within a couple more years, I'm not gonna be battling the grass so badly. But I just love that so many of these plants are actually either edible for us, can be used medicinally, or can be used to, for my pollinators, for the bees and all the other pollinators that come and visit my forest garden. So look at the self-seeding that happened with my calendula. <laughs> what I really need to do is get in here and thin this out or take a couple of scoops and just transplant some of these to a different area of the garden. But isn't this going to look absolutely gorgeous when these are all in bloom? This is the first California poppy that has actually bloomed in my garden. Isn't that pretty? Our peonies are just about ready. Probably in another week, this will be all blooming and that will look beautiful. I have some little sunflowers poking up in here. This is called bachelor button. It's not a cheerful little flower. And a ton of yarrow. I love yarrow. It's a great plant. It is a medicinal plant. It can be used for all kinds of different things, but it is definitely invasive. It will spread everywhere. As you can see, it has spread all throughout this area of the forest garden. And I have actually already pulled out quite a few of these plants this year. So just keep that in mind if you are going to use that in any space, it will take it over. This plant that you can see behind me here, this is called comfrey. It's absolutely beautiful. It's one of my favorite plants. 
and that's why it's still here and not lopped down and feeding the soil like it's supposed to be. So the idea behind a comfrey is that it is something called a dynamic accumulator. And what that means is it can collect nutrients from down deep because it has a tap root that will go way down that the other plants that are around it, like this apple tree that's above it, can't necessarily access. And the idea is that it will suck all those up into these big, beautiful leaves, and then you can cut those leaves down and lay them around your fruit tree. And then as it rains and they break down, it can feed um, the roots of the tree and make it more readily accessible, all of those good nutrients. That's the whole idea. So I really need to cut these down. I just haven't wanted to because they're so beautiful. They will grow up again at least once more throughout the season and I probably have enough here. I'll be able to spread it around a couple of the fruit trees. I did go down, dig down in the early spring and found some roots down below, cut off some little sections about three inches long and then planted them under my other fruit trees and they are actually growing. So that's one of the ways you can propagate um, comfrey yourself. One of the things to keep in mind about comfrey is that it can be really invasive if it is not a specific kind and I think it's called Balking 16. I'll put up here um, the name of the variety of this kind that is not um, invasive. It is something that you need to propagate around yourself which is what you want. You wouldn't want this stuff just completely taking over your garden because then nothing else would grow. <laughs> This space here looks like an overgrown mess and it kind of is, but it does have a purpose. All of the plants you can see here are biennials, meaning that they need a, sec a second year in order to be able to send up seeds. And one of the things that I'm trying to go uh, to do in my garden this year is to do a lot of my own seed saving. It was an interesting experience to be shopping for seeds. I'm sure most of you have experienced this this year and not be able to find the seeds that are usually readily available. So I really want to start seed saving myself. So what I did is I saved the best root vegetables from my root cellar. So this is a turnip, not anymore, now it's nice beautiful flowers. In behind here are parsnips and this beautiful plant here is actually a beet and then I have some carrots in behind. Now I did my research before planting all of these close together to make sure that none of these plants, whoa, <laughs> will um, cross pollinate and none of these will so you can plant them in close by each other. So the idea is that all of these plants, as you can see, there's flowers here, beautiful flower heads here on the parsnips and then they will form seeds and I will harvest the seeds. That is the goal. This is the first time I've ever done this with biennials before. So we'll see how it's gonna go. I will let you know as the season progresses how I did with my seed saving from these plants. This plant here, this may be one of the most exciting things in my forest garden. This is an elderberry. And can you see right here? There's flowers. Oh, I'm so excited. There's not many, there's just a few. There's probably about I don't know, 10 flowers, but maybe I'll get a few elderberries this year. I don't know. This is exciting. I learned how to make elderberry syrup for the first time this spring. I just ordered some dehydrated um, elderberries from, I think it was Organic Matters is where I ordered them from. Um, I'll link that down below for you if you're interested, if you can't grow your own. And we absolutely loved the syrup. So I can't wait until this grows. I planted three more um, elderberry bushes this year as well. And I did put this arch up. This is a new one. Last year I had this one here and I added this one just because I love them. And then I planted some climbing beans that are not doing very well because of the cold weather along the bottom. So we'll All right, let's get on to the vegetable garden. And we'll start with the brassicas because they're not minding this cold weather at all. I have lots of broccoli, lots of cauliflower, tons and tons of beautiful purple cabbage, and some sweet little market cabbages that are just starting to form heads. And then these beauties, this is my absolute favorite kale in the world. It is called abundance kale. And look at these leaves. There are so many things to love about abundance kale. The first thing is the fact that it is prolific. This kale will grow three to four feet tall. It actually didn't bolt for me at all last year. And the thing that I love about it the most is the fact that these leaves are so tender and you can eat them. You know how most kale is a really strong flavor and the leaves are really thick. It's better to slice it really thin or bake it in the oven or do or cook it in some kind of way to eat it. You can eat this raw. 
Mm. I don't even know how to explain the flavor. It tastes like a kale, a little bit like a broccoli leaf. Mm. It's so good. I'm constantly munching on this. Um, these seeds were just about impossible to find this year. I had seed saved from last year. Um, and so I'm going to do the same thing this year because I don't ever want to not have abundance kale in my garden. So delicious. I am a little bit concerned about my broccoli this year because it has been so cold. And I've mentioned this in broccoli videos in the past, but if the temperatures get too cold at the early state um, or at the early part of growing broccoli, then it, they will tend to send out a really tiny little head. And I have noticed, you can see over here that there is a broccoli head forming and that looks pretty tiny. And so does that one. Not all of them are um, forming heads yet, so I'm hoping it's just going to happen to a few of them and it doesn't happen to the entire crop because that would be really, really sad. I love me some broccoli. What is that? That, my friends, is a cabbage worm and we do not want that in the garden. That is the second cabbage worm I've found. Let's see, do we have any eggs? Your best bet for cabbage worms is to just check all of your any of your brassicas and pick them off if you see them. Normally I don't have a big problem with pests in my garden. I'll usually have the occasional cabbage worm like that but nothing serious but this is a little bit early in the season for me to be seeing them which makes me a little bit nervous. <laughs> Here is another example of my rather sad looking squash. And another one, that one's even tinier than the other ones. This is kind of the thing with gardening. Every year is different. Last year I had issues with excess moisture in the fall and I cabbages I think that rotted early. I wasn't able to store those. I had squash that were rotting. And then now this year we had this really cold spring. It's always an adventure. And this is something I've never experienced before. Not the weeds, I've experienced those a lot, but this is absolutely beautiful. This is ruby chard, absolutely gorgeous. But this one decided to bolt, which is so strange because we have had no hot weather to speak of, maybe two days, and that's all it took. And I usually don't get bolting on these until into August. So I have started to incorporate some landscape fabric into my garden. I'll talk to you about that a little bit more in just a minute. But I, um, these are all my pickling cucumbers and they're doing really, really well. I had them all covered as you can see here. This is actually just straight wire fencing that I used. And then I had these all covered with plastic up until two days ago. So I have kind of a love-hate relationship with the landscape fabric. <laughs> and this is why, is that the landscape fabric is made out of plastic. And even though I did buy some that has, I think it was a 12 year life or something like that, quite a long lifespan. It's still going to end up in the landfill. And I just, I'm just conflicted about that. So I don't think I'm going to be someone that has my entire garden covered with landscape fabric. I'll use the stuff that I have now because I already have it, put all the holes in it and everything. Um, but I don't think it's gonna be something that I'm going to use regularly. I much prefer the deep mulch, mulch method that I use in um, my garden. And I know that doesn't work for everyone, anyone that has to deal with slugs or snails or anything like that. Mulch is not always the best thing, but in my dry climate, it works really well. So I think this will be definitely the preferred method in my garden, but I will use the um, landscape fabric where I already have it down. But it certainly worked really well for the heat loving plants, being able to have them with the black, which warmed up the ground more um, and kept the weeds down and everything like that. So, so again, like I said, love, hate. Onions are doing super, super, super well. This is a hundred foot row and I have three rows in it. One of the things that I do have to do with my onions is get in here and give them a little bit of a haircut. I talked about this um, last year, but whenever you prune anything, if you prune them properly, um, it encourages new growth on most plants and onions are no different. And one of the things that you want is as many of these beautiful green onion tops as possible because each one of them equates to a line in your onion and the more of these you have the larger your onion is going to be my friend rachel from that 1870s homestead who if you have not checked out you absolutely must i'll link her video or her um, channel down in the description box below but she was saying in i think a video last week 
that she actually had dehydrated the tops of these and then ground them into a powder and made a really light tasting um, onion powder out of these, which I'm gonna try. I think that's a super cool idea. Normally I'll just con compost my onion tops, but this year I'm trying to put up as much from my garden as possible. So I'm gonna try dehydrating them. I'm also going to try um, just freezing them in small containers to be able to add to soups. And I will probably try the um, onion powder trick because I think that's a really cool idea. I also have beets, turnips, rutabagas, and peas in my garden as well, but I really want to show you the high tunnel greenhouse, so I think we will jump over there. So this is the north side of the greenhouse, and these doors were actually designed by Bert, who is a subscriber of mine, and you probably have seen him down in the comment section below. And he also sent us the brackets and all the hardware to build these, which we were so incredibly grateful for. So we have a single door on this side, and then down on this end, there are double doors. And those are so that we can bring our tractor in and till this or any other, or bring in any amendments or whatever we need. The reason that this side does not have double doors is because we are going to be actually framing this and plywood, putting plywood on this. And there will be a wood stove here. The idea of this high tunnel for us is to be able to create a little microclimate in here so we can grow the heat loving crops and also to extend our seasons out on both sides. And like I mentioned up in the garden, because we get really cool temperatures in the evening, if we get any of those cold temperatures, we can heat up the greenhouse with the wood stove and that will help to keep everything developing. <clears throat> One of the things I've always struggled with growing tomatoes, even in my little greenhouse up there, is that because the temperatures start getting so cool by mid-August in the evening, is it stunts the ripening of the fruit, and I always end up with tons and tons of green tomatoes, and I certainly do not want that to happen in this greenhouse, because that would be a lot of green tomatoes. So that is the plan here, and that is why this wall is like this. Oh, I cannot wait to show you this. This may be my new favorite plant. This is a tomatillo. You guys saw me start these from seed back in, I think it was the beginning of um, April is when I started these. But I have never grown tomatillos before, so this is a first to me. And just even the leaves, oh, they smell so darn good. Um, one of the things about a tomatillo that I have learned this year is that you do need to have more than one of them in order for them to cross pollinate. The other thing about growing on in a high tunnel is there aren't as many pollinators as there are outside. I do have pollinators coming through here, but I have been hand pollinating these. So all I do is pluck off a flower and then from one plant, and then I go to one of the other plants and I just touch the end of it and go around and pollinate all of these beautiful flowers. Tomatillos are super prolific. I have one, two, three, four, five, six plants, which might be a little bit extreme. Um, but like I said, I hadn't grown them before, so I just wanted to see. But aren't these beautiful and they're so huge. And for those of you that haven't seen a tomatillo before, so this is a husk. And inside of this husk is where the actual fruit forms. So once um, this expands and I can start to see the fruit out of the bottom, I'll harvest them and you harvest them when they are green. They can go um, overripe really quickly. So you have to do keep an eye on them. So over beside me here, you can see my pepper plants. I am so happy with these. I don't know if you guys remember, I think it was the last video that I did back in April and I was showing um, how tiny my pepper plants were. And one of the things that I learned about starting peppers from seed is they are super sensitive to overwatering, which I did do. And they just looked absolutely pathetic when I put them in here. And I was questioning whether I would get a harvest at all, but I'm happy to say that they are absolutely loving. Look at that. <laughs> they are absolutely loving being in the high tunnel and look at all of the buds on this. And there's even a flower over there. They are just budding out like crazy. So I do believe I am going to get a pepper harvest. I have about 150 peppers of various kinds, I think. I planted about five or six different varieties. So I'll link a list of those down below if I remember. If I don't remember, let me know in the comment section and I'll make sure to do that um, in case you're curious to see what kinds of peppers I planted. All right, on to the tomatoes. Look at this beautiful tomato plant. So all of the tomatoes along this side are paste tomatoes. And these plants were actually quite a lot smaller than the tomatoes I'll show you on the other side of the greenhouse in a minute. 
but they have taken off and are doing really well. You can see that some of my tomato plants do have leaf curl like this, and this is nothing really to worry about. Um, it's caused in this case by heat. And if you've noticed, I have a shade cloth on the top of this, and that is why it helps to bring the temperature down. When the sun comes out, it can hit 45 degrees Celsius in here within a matter of like 30 minutes. <laughs> so um, the shade cloth was really, really essential for <clears throat> keeping the temperature cool. And having both of these doors, and we also situated this greenhouse so the prevailing winds, winds would be able to blow through, makes a huge difference in keeping the overall temperature down. But it's still pretty warm. Whew, I'm getting hot. I just did all my pruning on my bush tomatoes and as you can see I've left all of my pruning mess in the aisle <laughs> but so they're looking a little bit sparse compared to what they were yesterday but so beautiful ah I know I just keep saying that over and over and over again you guys know I love gardening gardening is my passion and having this greenhouse has been a dream of mine for a long long time um we like to buy secondhand and i've mentioned that lots of times in videos um and so we had shopped around for probably at least a year to try to find a secondhand greenhouse and that's what this is we got this greenhouse from a nursery down in the okanagan so to be able to have it to be able to have started all of my own plants from seed this year which is something that i haven't done before and then to have it actually growing the way that it's growing it's just such a huge blessing. So that's why I'm so happy. <laughs> but anyway, so all of the plants that are down this trellis here, so this is actually concrete mesh. We were able to get a whole bunch of concrete mesh from a friend of mine for a really, really good price. And then T-posts to hold it up. And then I have a double row of bush tomatoes here. These are all Manitoba bush tomatoes. And there's a couple of other, there's uh, Stupis. Some people say Stupis, I've heard it's Stupicha, Stupice. But anyway, I have a few of those in here as well. And I think a couple of cherry tomatoes that accidentally got interdispersed in with these. But these are doing phenomenal. And I have so many tomatoes on them already. I'll show you that in a minute. All of the tomato plants of these, this variety all have tomatoes about this size, which is absolutely amazing for the middle of June in my growing zone. I can't believe it. As you can see, I've planted basil interdispersed amongst all of my tomato plants and the basil is absolutely loving being in here. Probably one of my next videos will be an herb harvest harvesting video because I have so many herbs all over the property that really need to get into the dehydrator. But I'm super happy with the way that all of the different basils I have planted in here have been growing. I have a really cute one. I'll show you that one. This is one of my favorite new basils. This is an Italian dwarf basil. It isn't that the sweetest little basil and it smells so good and it's very prolific. Love it. This greenhouse has taken a lot of time to get to the place that it's at. Um, just getting all of the earth moved to be able to put the greenhouse where we have it. There was a lot of earth moving involved and just figuring out how to build one of these. We've never done it before and we bought this one secondhand. So my husband had actually gone down to where we bought it from and took it apart. So at least he knew how it went back together again. But then my husband also works full time. So it was trying to juggle um, getting this done in time to put all of the plants in the ground around his work schedule and everything else. So it did take quite some time to be able to get it to this point and we're still not quite finished, but at least it is growing abundantly. All right, I think I had better sign off on this video for now. Otherwise it's just gonna be going on for far too long. I have so many other things that I wanna share with you and show you, but that will have to wait until a future video. I hope you enjoyed this video everyone and I'll see you again soon. Bye.